Man, I, I'll just jump in. I, I wanted to ask you, you know, it's funny because l- last week when we were supposed to do it, your album, new one, came out for Criss Cross, right? Ex- exactly on that date, officially, I mean. And uh, a glimpse yeah. of the eternal. And, uh, right. you, you know, how did this one happen? I mean, you know, it's kind of your old people you play with, but like, especially about the repertoire, I wanted to ask you, you know, you wrote again some cool music and... Uh, But there's like some mm-hmm. tunes which you you know I, I remember what when, when I first when we met when I saw your iPad or iPod was it we, we didn't have that back here yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, and right, you, right. you had like you know Garbarek and Christina Aguilera or Beyonce you had everything on all the yeah. jazz pop and and uh, right. how did you decide now on this new record I mean there's a Ralph Downer tune there's a Vince Mendoza Garbarek And there's a Michael Caine composition. I love Michael Caine. Like, how did you set up all these stuff for the new one? Well, you know, I had done nine records for Criss Cross and then yeah. Jerry Teakins passed away a couple of years ago, you know, the, the yeah. owner. And um, so I thought, well, that's it, you know. And uh, yeah, I've been, you know, I've been doing all these other records. I, I mean, I moved out here. I've been doing different stuff. I've been doing all these electronic records and all this different stuff. And I, I do have another acoustic record with all these young guys from la that oh, really? hasn't oh. we did we, we did a couple of years ago it's all my compositions all kind of long compositions shit oh, amazing. but um it's not it's coming out on this la label but it's not out yet it's probably going to come out in a few months but um but other than that i've been doing this electronic stuff but then uh mike marciano from systems two who's been you know my friend and engineer for many, many years, many, many of my albums um, called me and said, hey, you know, Criss Cross is getting back together. Jerry Teakins, also the same name as his father, only spelled with a J instead of a G, um, is taking over because oh, really? his father, his dream was that his, his, you know, the kids would take over the label and keep it going Well, when he passed. So he said, would you, you know, he wants to get some of his Jerry's favorite, the original Jerry's favorite people on the label to do Uh, albums for them again and start up again and they're, they're going to do really do it right and they're going to make LPs and everything like that and I thought oh, wow. and he said would you want to do one and I was like you know I don't I don't know this Jerry you know his son and I you know I we I had a, a relationship with Jerry the, the original owner that was super kind of respectful and loose I mean you know he had a re- reputation of not always being that way with people but yeah. with me I just did what I wanted like I mean I would just do the record and send it to him. And like, you know, it was, and then he was into it. He just really loved what I did. So I thought, you know, it's probably not going to be that way with this guy, you know? So I said, you know, to Mike, I said, I don't think so. I don't think I want to get in, you know, he said, well, why don't you just talk to the guy? So I said, all right. So I started to talk to Jerry, the, the son, and he ended up being super cool. And he's like a finance guy. He's not really mm. like a music guy, but he, There's a couple of things good about that. First of all, he wanted to honor his dad sing. And through me and through Mike, we told him how his, we, my relationship was with his father. And then also Jerry, the son, is also really good with finance, right? And good businessman. So he's much more organized That's than his father idea. was. I loved his father, but his father wasn't you know, great at the business side of it. Um, so, so we talked and I, I actually really liked him. And I thought, you know what? Let me do it. I'll just... I, I'm going to be in New York anyway. Let me, you know, let me just do it with some New York guys and, and get the band I like with my friends. Yeah. And, um, and I thought with Jerry senior, I was always talking about doing a, he, we always talked about doing a ballads record and I just never did a ballads record for, I would do ballads on the albums, but I was always yeah. doing kind of my compositions. And then sometimes I would do other people's, but I like, it was always kind of like a lot of intense shit. And, um, So I, I said to this chair, I said, well, maybe I'll do the ballads record, finally kind of honoring your father and stuff. So that was the plan. As it got closer, I, but, but like a covers ballad record, I was thinking, mm, yeah, um, yeah. and keeping everything really short and stuff. As it got closer, I kind of 
change that a little bit. And then I it start, started to be like, instead of standards, ballads, short versions, I started to think about maybe doing some of the stuff I grew up listening to that's kind of obscure that I really love. Yeah. And um, so I picked a, a Garber. I picked a lot of tunes. I mean, I picked a bunch of tunes and we, we went through them and picked, narrowed it down to like, you know, 10 things. But um, but I have like 40 things between me and Ivan. And we picked a lot of stuff. And, you know, I had those two Towner tunes. I had Garbrick one. There was that Michael Caine tune. And I used to play with Michael a lot in New York. And uh, mm. and I loved that tune off that Anthony Cox record. Yeah. And I was yeah. like, let me, let me, that's really obscure, but I, I love it. And I kind of want to give it some more attention. So that, and then I wrote a couple things of my own and then did one standard that I had been recently been playing, but I had not really. I had the craziest dream, which I didn't really know until recently. My friend Doug Webb out here, um, he uh, he showed it to me on a gig, and we played, mm. and I loved it. So, so we just kind of we went in the studio and kept it loose and and did these tunes, and um, it just worked. I mean, those guys are so great, sure. and, yeah, and uh, sure. the vibe was just really we ca- captured the vibe. Everybody knows that music, and really, and we kind of just captured it. And I I really was just really happy with the record and um but that's yeah that's how it happened and so now it's out and it seems like people love it like the the response i've gotten has been like over the top it's great so um yeah it's that's how it happens uh i just wanted because i had been doing all this other completely other stuff i just wanted to do something different a little bit more low-key a little bit shorter takes um something that was you know maybe you know, way more accessible to people, even Mm -hmm. even though, you know, so, and it is, I I realize that people really react to um, stuff that's a little bit, you know, I, sometimes I write stuff that's pretty intense and also the electronic stuff is maybe too new for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Although I've got really good response for that too, but from a different crowd. Um, But anyway, it, it, it it just, I don't know. I'm really happy with, I'm really glad that I decided to do it and that they asked me and, uh, yeah there'll, there'll be more you know and he's gonna there's gonna be an lp of it maybe at the end of the year i think oh, gonna have the LP. Man, yeah. yeah so so yeah anyway i'm sorry to, i i'm long-winded sometimes but that's um that's the story of that record oh it's beautiful i, I mean also a lot of you know your story with dan and ivan and uh craig is it's incredible and i, I remember like the first time i saw you guys in 55 it was with jacob and then yeah. And I think it was Thomas on bass, Morgan. Thomas and, was in the original band, yeah. Yeah, and it, you were just, I mean, I think it was, was one of the best gigs I ever saw. Like, you know, because you in the 55, that was like, you, you know, the energy that, that you guys created. Yeah, and but I, I wanted to yeah, ask Yeah, that you, was... Just this, like, you know, you mentioned you, you're working in LA now. I saw also with younger guys, and you had this energy of seeking up all these incredible talents and like i remember dan was then like i don't know 12 or something and they all were yeah how did you hook up with those guys do you remember like with, with them let's say or ivan or i met them through um christoph schweitzer you know christoph oh yeah the with trombone player sure sure yeah yeah so, so chris christoph had this band that we were all in and oh. uh he had that he had that was the rhythm section and uh, we went on tour Oh, we wow. played, and I I, re- I just really loved the band. And then Christoph kind of went back to Europe eventually. But I I remained friends, and of course, especially me and Dan got along right away. We've been friends forever. Um, and I just made it my bands, and we did the fifty five all that time. We built it up, and and then Thomas got super busy, and I just had to replace him because I was always having to get subs, and then Ivan was always subbing, and not, so Ivan. Yeah got in the band and then that became another thing and jacob was in and out of the band so at different times craig was in it for five years and so i've had that relationship with craig and then matt mitchell at the end the last couple of years i was mm. matt mitchell was in it um but it was always consistently like a unbelievably fertile yeah. band but yeah i just you know i i like the energy of young musicians and um you know and la i don't know if you remember but i, I grew up out here you know yeah, and sure, I, I, sure. 
I moved when I was 19 and went to New York and I was there for 36 years and then got married and, and moved, we needed bigger space and it was too expensive in New York and stuff. Sure. And I, we were out here and I was like, you know what? I mean, because musically, I just never liked it here. I liked everything else. I mean, look at this. It's just like... Yeah, yeah man, I know. Man. <laughs> it's, it's like, you know, paradise. But, um, it's a dream, you know, yeah. Here's the pool here. Um, but, you know, it's... But musically... I was just not, it was a business town and there was good musicians, but they weren't the kind of musicians I really loved. Yeah. Um, so I could never do it. I was always really dying to get back to New York. And then when I, when New York changed in a way that I wasn't really that into, and then I got married and then I was out here and then LA, I had seen it coming for a long time. I kept telling people LA is going to change. You're going to see, like I've been telling people that for 10 years at least. And the young people here, uh, maybe because of the internet or whatever, just started to be hip to like a New York way of thinking, basically. Yeah. And, and so I came out here and I started meeting these kids who were all going to leave and move to New York. I, a lot of them I sort of talked into staying here, which I think they're happy now. But, um, and the scene here just, it got way better. And then, and then now during the pandemic, half of New York moved here. You know, Mark Turner lives here now. Yeah. Like Richardson, like yeah. Chris B, like Steve Lehman, like, you know, Jeff Parker, yeah, you know, down the line, place, yeah, yeah. Mark Giuliano, Gretchen Parlotta, you know, Justin Brown, I could go down the line. Um, so the scene here is, it's just, we need more places to play. The pandemic is kind of yeah, you know, sure. I mean, stopping yeah. that. But the scene is really good. So for once, I kind of felt like, wow, I can move back here because musically, it's good. And I can kind yeah. of groom these young people and give them that New York thing. And so I did. I with young people, you can kind of that are really they're super talented already, but you can also talk to them and tell them, "Hey, do this, do that." Um, and so I did, and kind of taught them a different way of doing things and more energy and all that. And so that's become a little bit more pervasive in LA now, and um, it's great. So now mm. these young guys are just like Dan and Thomas and Jacob were. I mean, they're uh, totally on that level and really killing you'll hear the record that's coming out it's oh, like it's, it, yeah. wow it's next level so it just became it's good it's good now so i can play and also the gigs are just it's actually more creative here now than it is in new york i would say because um new york still has this thing that's because of so many musicians in one in tiny little yeah. fighting for tiny little gigs and also the school thing there's this separation that happens there that doesn't happen here um it's just more open, and I think creatively, I, the stuff here is is just it's cooler right now, you know. And New York forever was great, but oh, I, sure. I just, and it will be again. I just think now that this is the place to be, so it's very comfortable. And I've always been too attracted to that energy, you know. Um, yeah. So yeah, so I'm around that a lot here. So again, young young players, you know. Yeah, I love that with you. Yeah, I mean, uh, are you aware of? At least for me and uh, for my generation, let's say, definitely, or even, of course, younger also, how much of an influence you were, you know, especially compositionally. I mean, I, I wore out, man, South, when you gave me South and Welcome to Life, uh, you know, th those are records yeah. which ch compositionally changed my perspective of what you can do. And, uh, like, how is your, your view on this now? Like, Well, you know, as you get older... Uh, you know, you can kind of see things, you know, differently. Like I was just kind of doing what I was doing, but trying yeah. to be always forward thinking. And still, I mean, I think what I'm doing now is, you know, way past those records. But, um, sure. but you know, and I think what will happen is you'll see a generation past your generation is going to be influenced by my younger, these newer records. But I think it's, yeah, I see that now. I and I I see that. Um, I and also when I left New York, I was really surprised at how many people said, "Wow, you're really missed in New York." Like your vibe mm. and your whole thing. I, it was it's very it, it's humbling and very like and it's a very good feeling. Um, and you know, I it makes me feel good. What, what am I going to sure. say? Seriously. It's like it ma makes me feel good. And uh, yeah, I, I guess I do realize it now because I constantly hear it from people from all over the world. People come up to me, oh, that record, this record. Yeah. And now I'm hearing it about these new records, especially the electronic ones. People yeah. are like, man, this is stuff that's like really influential to me. And um, 
yeah i mean it's not what I, i'm just trying to make music but it's really oh, sure, sure. A, good, yeah, yeah. a good side effect of that is is um and i love helping you know young people and trying to so yeah it's 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 an honor you know it's like I, i'm happy that people feel that way and it, and, yeah. and i am seeing it so it is nice to be I, business doesn't seem to have caught up with that yet <laughs> like the <laughs> the powers that be don't really see that yet i probably maybe they will at some point but but i see it from the the people you know and the, the young musicians especially and um yeah, people definitely. of your generation you yeah. know definitely so yeah, yeah. it's great I, I, yeah, I love it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. Sp speaking of you, you know, you as a musician and a player, I think you're probably one of the most recognizable alto saxophone players. It's again me speaking, but I mean, I, I hear you play like you know three bars, and I know it's you. And uh, how did you work on this? You know, the development of your sound. Even when, when I, rem I remember the Lang Sank records. Or even the Lost Tribe, you know, like let's say early '90s, already you had yeah. the, it's you, you know, and we're talking about music that's been done 30 years actually ago. That's a long time. But how do you see yeah. the, de the development of your sound? I mean, how did you start well, doing you know that? What? That's a that's a good question for now because there's a, a lot. Of, I mean, I could say a lot about that, but you know, um, I'll try to make it short. But in, first of all, it's being conscious of your sounds, right? Of being conscious of like trying to have your own sound where you are in the, in the scope of things, uh, where you sit amongst other people that play your instrument and what your sound is like. Um, and I think one of the biggest problems that I have, is, and this goes, and this is what I try to change with a lot of younger people when I teach, and I teach a lot, but is what happens with the jazz school thing. Yeah is that people got super into, you know, because they, they were constantly being told to transcribe and you have to learn and you have to play like this before you can play like yourself, right? Which is, in my view, not the case. I mean, yeah, you have to learn the history, no question. But to copy, to copy it to an extent of like the pressures that they give you in a lot of those schools or a mm -hmm. lot of that, a certain generation, of you must know this and you know, I, I don't that's there's not enough time in your life to do that because what happens is people they get involved in that and they get so concerned with you know transcribing and memorizing solos and getting it to sound like this person or that person yeah. that all of a sudden they find themselves in their 30s and they don't have their own sound yet and then it's like at that point it's pretty much too late like that's who you are you don't even have time. Your life has started. It's not, you know, so, 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 you know, I somehow I had teachers who were kind of old school teachers, but they were really hip. And they kind of told me like, you know, try to get your own sound. And like, you know, and I would read these things about Miles or Wayne Shorter or whatever. Mm -hmm. and, and Wayne Shorter is a good example, because if you listen to Wayne with Art Blakey, he sounds yeah. a lot like Train, you know, like, yeah, yeah. Like his sound. yeah. And then you hear him with Miles and you know that Miles pulled him aside and was like, man, you got to like, you got away from that. And all of a sudden, you know, you hear Wayne start to become Wayne. And then now you hear Wayne in like two notes, you know, that's Wayne Shorter because he, he but that's a conscious decision. And I think what happens with a lot of kids now, a lot of younger people, I shouldn't say just kids, but they're not thinking that way. They're, they're, they've been told that you have to do this and you yeah. have to do it this way and you have to they're not being encouraged to sound like themselves. And so they don't even know how to do it. So a lot of times I come up against, you know, these kids who are, who are wanting to hear that. They're super excited to hear somebody's talk about that, but they don't know how to do it because they've yeah. never been taught how to um, even think about having your own sound. So for me, I was always thinking about having my own sound. So what that is, basically is a pro process of elimination so what you're doing is you're learning you're you're going to assimilate anyway like sure. i never transcribed or memorized the solo in my life that's just me i just haven't but if you hear me play a bebop tune you're going to hear a lot of stuff that sounds like i've transcribed all my life 
because you assimilate. I listened to my ass right. like way more than anybody else, probably. But you assimilate that anyway. But um, the thing is, you know, I, and I'm not saying learning that stuff. is you, No, you, you need to, to learn it to some extent. You certainly need to listen to it and sure. know what it is. But but you need to what I did, was doing was when I would hear myself repeating stuff that I knew I got somewhere or that was familiar to me, I immediately tried to get rid of it. So instead of like what students yeah. do now is they try to learn, they try to work on it more and they challenge each other. There's like, you know, there's like these people on, I won't say names, but people on the internet that basically that's all they do. It's like they sound like this person or that person yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah. don't sound like themselves. And yet sure. there's, they get tons of likes and streams and whatever. And yeah, yeah, they can play the instruments, but it's like, who cares? You know, that's yeah. not that that's not going to be remembered. That's not yeah. going to be remembered. That's going to be like, oh, they're good at the technical part of the horn, but or whatever the instrument. But um, so you have to create your own sound, especially in a crowded field. You have to have your own voice in anything. Whether, I don't care what the profession is or what it, you have to have your own voice. That's sure. the way you're going to have a career. So. I talk to people about that now, but I've always kind of known that from the teachers I had. And also I came up in an era where they still championed um, having an individual sound, but more yeah. than learning something from someone else, it's getting rid of stuff that you've actually picked up from other people. And that's what people aren't taught. It's like, even if you transcribe and memorize all the solos, that's good technique. You got the thing, but then forget it. You got to like, if, if you start hearing yourself play those things, get rid of them. And then people always ask me that, well, what do you Important replace too. it with? Well, that's the million dollar question that makes who the artist is, right? It's like how you replace those things that as somebody else did makes you the artist that you are can be. Okay. And not many people can do that. Very few people can do it. Very few people can, you know, figure out what to replace it with. But the people who do and replace it with something unique are the people that actually are artists and have something to say and will yeah. continue to be, you know. So that's, but people don't, students don't hear that now. They don't hear that, but it's huge. It's, it's, it's super important. I've always been aware of that. I always worked on it. If I heard myself, I was listening to myself, I was like, oh, you know what? I've heard, you know, Brecker do that or whoever. And sure. then I was like, let me let me get rid of that. And I would get rid of it. And it's comfortable. So it's hard to get rid of because, man, I like playing that, you know, but but I was like, yeah. no. So then what do I replace it with? I replace it with something else that I come up with or I just leave space, which is also something to do is just, you know, if you can't think of anything to play, you don't leave space there. Play some, you know, react to the. Just, I started to think of playing more as sound and yeah. re reaction and making sound on the horn and less about licks or whatever it is and that people think about. Um, so it's that. And I just have always thought about that and always been concerned with that. And always have, I'm still there. Like when I, I'm always developing in that way. Like, oh, you know what? Even with my own stuff, like, I'm like, oh, you know what? I'm tired of hearing myself play this. Let me not do that. And um, yeah. I'll stop it. I'll stop, you know, I'll stop whatever that thing is. And, and that's how you grow, you know? Um, also just keeps life interesting because you have to keep Definitely. changing, yeah. you know? So yeah, I, like I think it's that. just a consciousness of yeah. that. I like that with you because, you, you know, many times, like in the early stages, like you said, of recorded artists in the beginning, they're not themselves yet in a way sound wise and with you it's yeah. like you know you listen to point game or luxury of guessing or like the early stuff for lang sang and it's like you know it's you you play like basically what you said now what you described it's there right. already so well you know you got you also got to remember i didn't make my first record till a point game i made when i was 29 yeah so i think it came out when i was actually 30 now i've made 30 albums yeah. now, now since then in the last 30 years but um but i didn't make a record until until first of all i was i felt like i was ready to i think nowadays people oh i'm gonna make a record they make a record super young 
and they're always they're not ready to make records usually i mean first of all who cares like they're not they're not interesting yet second of all but people think oh they have to make them and to get work yeah. and all that stuff whatever i just worked a day job for 10 years and worked on music privately and so i felt like i had something to say um and I think that's a little bit of a, a loss. I think people sometimes now make records too young and when they're not really ready yeah. to, and then they get a lot of attention when they're young and then, then they don't really find a voice because they've gotten this attention and they don't develop the music and then they, yeah. got, they get forgotten young also because they're like the next young person comes along. You know, So I think it's better for me, it was better to just have a long view of the career start later everything's always happened to me 10 years later than everybody else um and then you know just be the champion of the underground of which i have been forever um which is fine you know and uh and make records that i i i love every record i've made i feel oh, like man, i've sure. only made i've just made records when i felt like i had something to say and um I've, of course, now I feel like I always have to, I'm working on you know, four different records at a time. But, you know, I feel uh, oh, at this true. point in my life as, as an artist, I have a lot to say. So I, I'm always trying to do stuff. But, you know, back then I, I wasn't sure yet until I finally, finally was ready. You know? So I think that's another thing. I think uh, my advice to younger people would be like, wait till you have something to say yeah. you're always going to be judged by that first yeah. thing anyway first thing that comes out is like whatever you got to review everyone's you know i always tell people it's like if they review it and it's not that good and they give it like you know three stars and down beans, like then the next time that comes, the next record you do might be killing but it comes across that that writer's desk or whoever's yeah. doing it or listeners you know thing on spotify or whatever and they're like oh, i didn't like the first record they just skip it because they won't even yeah. Like, I don't, you know what I mean? Instead of yeah. coming out, hitting the ground running, as they say, you know, and hitting hard with your first thing. So people notice and go, oh, I want to hear the next thing. I can't wait for the next thing. So I think doing something that's sort of half-assed or sounds like everybody else early on is like, what's the point? Yeah. You know, it's like, really, that's not going to do you any good. You know, sorry, I'm going to move. <laughs> Moving and I want to stay in it. Um, <laughs> How, how did you know for Point Game that when you were ready? I mean, I, I spoke with Michael Caine the other day, and you, you know, he couldn't give more praise for Point Game, saying in your discography it's quite an underrated record in a sense, also how strong compositionally it is, also, which I agree. But how, how did you, how did you feel you were ready for to become become, become a band leader for the, with that record? When did you? Well, that's that's interesting because Point Game, I like Point Game still. But I think that's the one record that really is uh, highly influenced by, at that time, the M base scene. M -base, like yeah, Steve, yeah, yeah. Steve and Greg and, you know, Gary Thomas and that whole thing. And so I was into that stuff. I mean, you know, I was, that, that's what I was listening to a lot then. And, and um, I was super into it. And so I started, um, I played with, the chronology is a little off from in, me and my head was a long time ago. Oh, sure. Yeah, I know. It's like 30, so, 30 um, years. But I, I was, a friend of mine was over my place to make, I had a double cassette deck, right? And he was applying for a, a grant from the U.S. government for, uh, to do a recording. They used to have these grants for that. They might still, I don't think so, but they might. Um, and so he, he came over to dub his demo at my house. And he said, why don't you do this? And I was like, I don't, you know, I didn't even know about it, but when's the deadline? He goes, well, the deadline is tomorrow. And I'm like, well, how am I going to make a demo? And, and then I thought, you know, let me do it. So I just put on some Abersold. I played, a, I played an Ornette tune solo. I forget what round two oh, or wow, something man, I think it really? was. Oh, man. The solo version of that. I did a couple Abersold, like blues or maybe I got rhythm or something. I put it on the tape and sent it in. My friend didn't get the grant, but I got a grant. And I think, you know, like Richie Cole, somebody was on the yeah. panel at that time. It was an alto player, I think, and probably liked it. And was like, So I got this $3,000 grant. It wasn't much, but it was enough to go in one day and do a quick 
recording at systems too. And um, so I called some of the people I was listening to. I knew Lonnie Plaxico hmm. from something else. I called Lonnie, Adam Rogers. I had just met maybe the year before I had met him earlier on in the street, but we started playing maybe in 88. The wheel. Oh, oh, really? Oh, well. Yeah. Yeah. I've met him in the early eighties. though, when we were playing on the street, cause we, we, at a different time, we both played in the same band. This guy Hayward, who was a bass player, who was also a drug dealer, who eventually got uh, killed in the, uh, for drug things. But oh, anyway, right. um, we played. Vince Herring started in a band too. He took really? my place in it. It was BMF, the Bad Motherfuckers, <laughs> and we used to play in the street. And um, you know, when Steve was out in the street and all those Coleman and everyone was out in the street playing. And um, and anyway. So I started playing with Adam later uh, and I got into the Lost Tribe right around then. Yeah. Um, but then Ed Simon, I had heard on a Greg Osby record. Oh, yeah. Exactly. And he was like eight, 18. And I, he was playing with Kevin Eubanks at the time. And I went out to Long Island to see Eubanks play in, uh, at some place in Long Island. And I remember going up to Ed in the bathroom. I was wanting to talk to him. And he was literally taking a piss. And I was like, hey, <laughs> I was like trying to introduce myself. And he was like, can I just finish it? And I was like, yeah, I'm sorry. And so we started talking and we immediately hit it off. And I asked him to do this record. And uh, and then I called Smitty, who was playing with Steve Coleman. Yeah. And Smitty didn't know me, but I sent him the music and he really liked it. And so he got on board and we did this recording and I was using the Pitch Rider back then, which is what Greg was using a lot, and Gary Thomas in like Dijonette's band yeah. and stuff. And um, and so I just I wrote my way, but I but a lot of it was odd time, it, and it and um, it was kind of you know it was influenced by that sound, even though the compositions were not really that. Um, and that's how I did the record. And yeah, I like the record. It's got a good vibe and stuff. It's just I hear it as being you know, not totally myself. And then mm. I, I waited like five years to do, or to maybe it was three years, four years, I don't know, to do a second record. And when I came back and did the second record, it was totally different. And that's when it was really my sound. Like, uh, this luxury of guessing, right? Luxury of guessing. Yeah, that, that. that's and, the double horn thing. And that, yeah, that's, that's you. Yeah. So, yeah, that's got more horns and it's got, it just has more. It was, I had found myself as like a, started to find my voice with that record and then from that point on i just i just went with it and um so but so i like point game but it's i still feel like it was influenced and i you know i used to play with michael in because smitty loved that record so much that we became friends he put me uh in his band with michael really and um, I didn't know that. yeah oh, that's oh. how i know mike yeah we used to play in that band david gilmore reggie washington oh, wow. and um yeah and then uh, so yeah, that's how that happened. But, um, yeah, it's a good record. It's just, I, I could, I own it now. I could put it out again and put it on the, um, the streaming sites, but I haven't done that yet. I, I just, maybe cause I feel like, uh, it wasn't completely me yet. And I, I feel like, hmm. you know, but yes, people know about it. And then I think maybe it's on YouTube or something, but, um, but, uh, anyway, yeah, yeah. that was the start for me. Yeah, I mean, how, how, how did then Mythology Records happen, the story with that? I mean, because, you know, you've done records for Act Music and, you know, Criss Cross, obviously, and and other labels, but, like, you've been, like, one of the, you know, Burn has done it in the late 70s already, and, uh, right. you know, like, nowadays, like, all musicians have their own labels in a way. It's, like, almost more normal than having a <laughs> label in a way. Yeah, I know. Did you... I did it early on. Yeah, how uh, did that uh... happen? Well, I had um, I had uh, a record come out on Audio Quest, which mm -hmm. was Luxury of Guessing, which was a, a cable. There's still an audio cable company and, you know, hi-fi audio company and um, based out here. Um, and they signed me. I don't know how I must have sent in. I think Ed Simon did a record for them and he mentioned them and I sent in a a cassette probably, and uh, they liked it and they decided to do records. So I did Luxury of Guessing with this guy, Joe Harley, who's who's still a friend of mine, who's now the, he's the head of um, the reissues at Blue Note. He does mm -hmm. all the 
reissues of the, all the LPs on, on Blue Note. Um, so he, you know, produced or executive produced basically because I, I always did all the music stuff with my records, but, um, and they brought all the cables from here out to systems too. And we did that. Then we did a second record, which was free to dream. Yeah, that's um, a beautiful one. Yeah. But they had, uh, thanks, but they had decided to not do records anymore. And mine was in limbo because they hadn't released it yet. And so it just sat there for like a year. And I was like, man, this is a really good record. I really want to release it. So I made a deal with them to, um, to release it and um, on my own. So I thought, you know, I'll just release it on my own label. And um, at the time, the internet had just started yeah. basically and yep. and uh we we did a mythology records and i released it and then i you know we we did ed simon's ed simon record we did the land Zang record we did yeah. over the years we've done various records but um yeah it's not like i do my i just it's basically a name uh and, yeah, yeah sure and, yeah but uh but it's got a lot of records out on it now and that's basically how it started it just um I had this album and I needed to put it out and I probably sent it to some other people who rejected it. And I was just like, screw it. I'm going to put it out myself and I needed a label to do it. So I created mythology. Um, yeah. That's really how it started. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you know, free to dream and like already luxury of guessing has you starting all these connections, you know, with Chris Potter and Donnie and Ben Wander and Adam Rogers and, you know, mm -hmm. Scott Colley and, obviously Kenny Wallace and like all these, you know, all these musicians who are now basically what yeah. mo modern jazz is, you guys created basically that new sound in a way, at, at least in my years now, when I look at the New York scene developing, uh, how did these stories... Yeah, well, with, they were my peers. Yeah, how did these connections happen with Ben, let's say, or with Chris Potter and like uh, Donnie, like how did you guys hook up? Well... You know, a lot of those people you mentioned are from California. So um, Scott Hawley is from really, really right up oh, yeah, exactly. in yeah. Eagle Rock. Uh, Donnie's from Santa Cruz. Kenny's from Santa Cruz. Um, you know, Adam's from New York, but spent his summers in, in L.A. a lot because his father was a film director, um, a TV director. Um, you know, uh, so I I met Scott when he first moved, Scott Hawley, when he first moved to... Mm. to um, to New York because he, I don't know, through mutual friends, we connected. I knew about Scott, uh, but I didn't meet him until he moved to New York and he literally lived right around the corner. I lived on 72nd and Riverside and he lived on like 71st and what's now Riverside Boulevard, but it, it wasn't then. It was like closer. To, it was Amsterdam and then the, the, mm. uh, the water. But um, so he he lived there. So we, we became friends. We started playing together a lot. Then he eventually moved right across the street from me uh, into Harold Danko's old apartment um, oh, yeah. where we had a lot of sessions where Lance Ang started. Um, and oh, so I met, okay. Yeah, it was the 72nd Street. And then so Kenny and Donnie also from California. So when they moved from Donnie from Boston, Kenny from, from Santa Cruz, uh, when they came to California, we met and as Californians, we kind of all kind of gravitated to each other. Um, and we be, all became friends and we started to play a lot together, you know, and, um, and then we all became friends. I, eventually I got Kenny in my building in 2000 and he still lives there in the 72nd Riverside. And, uh, really? Yeah, he still lives in the same building, the one I just moved out of a few years ago. But um, Anyway, you know, we started playing together and then they became parts of my records. And then Chris Potter was just, he was already, I think, friends with Chris early on when he got to New York. Somehow we met soon after and we became friends. Um, we became friends through other friends and not super close friends, but friends. And then definitely in re well, recent years, 10, 10 15 <laughs> yeah, years, exactly, especially yeah. in the last recent last reason in the recent years especially the last maybe eight nine years me and chris have been re become really good friends especially since i moved out here like super close friends like when i go to new york i'll stay at his place and stuff um so we we've had a long association yeah. and playing a lot of gigs and traveling together and stuff 
and you know, you, they were just my peers also. And then also just, we were also friends. We would just always go out, you know, drinking and hanging. We were the crew, you know, me and Scott and Donnie and, and Chris and, and, uh, Adam and, yeah. you know, just a lot of people. We were, we were the crew we're always hanging together too, you know? So, um, it was friends and just happened to be like the best musicians in, in New York. Yeah, know? exactly. And yeah. they were, they were, you know, so, so yeah, so we still play, you know, I still, I see, I play with Adam a lot. I still play with Chris a lot. Um, Kenny, you know, I, I was supposed to do a duo record with Kenny like a couple of weeks ago um, out here. We, we have a duo record called Basu. Basu, yeah, I love that one, man. It's like, oh, thanks. Yeah, I really love yeah. that record, actually. It's got no attention, but man, that's a good record. But yeah, we were supposed incredible. to do, we were supposed to do a second version of that, but then he got COVID and then, Oh, so he was in New York, and so we're supposed to do it maybe in a in a month or something. But out here at the studio here in LA. But anyway, we're so we're still, you know, still we're I'm still working with a lot of those people, you know, yeah. and um, yeah, it's it's good. I mean, long they'll always be friends and and compatriots. You know? Yeah, I I just wanted to ask you that, that you know I mentioned Sal before, and I th I think I transcribed all those heads probably mm -hmm. wrong from that record <laughs> but you you know like it's just yeah. a melody it's like you, i'll be on the ideas like you you, you end the, the first song like you know you and chris overlapping like and it's so complex compositionally you know you mentioned odd meters yet it's so melodic it's like a pop song in a way you know because it's so listenable yet it's really complex and uh what's your process or then you have fun joshua which is like you know incredible unison lines like or whatever from that record or whichever record you do did what's your process when writing how do you come up with well, such diverse tunes you know in a one like, like i said in one way like really complex yet still so melodic well it's, i think it's different now than it was then but yeah. um a little bit but um not so different. There are similarities, but um, a few things I would say. I, I mean, I grew up with pop music. I grew up with jazz and pop music, but I was super influenced. You know, my first loves before jazz were, were pop was pop music. I was listening to Hendrix and Sly Stone at, um, you know, Motown, Stevie Wonder, yeah. The Temptations, Curtis Mayfield, Marvin Gaye, who's still one of my all-time favorites. Um, I was listening to Elton John. John, like early Elton John, which is killing, you know, yeah. um, and, you know, different rock things. And then I, and then I started to get into fusion was of my, you know, I was into the, all that 70s Herbie and George Duke and, and Stanley Clark and all that the weather report, of course. Um, but so for me, melody has always been like paramount. For me it's like the most important thing and i think in talking yeah. about let's say the relationship that i had uh with my fandom of like m bass at one point i think what i was missing from that music was the melodic side of it like yeah. it was very interesting uh, rhythmically to me but melodically i was like i don't know i, I just nothing here for me like and i think eventually that's what kind of why I drifted away from that because I was just like I, I need mean, yeah. something else yeah. so so I kind of for a long time had this odd meter thing still in my head because I always felt odd meters in writing it um it wasn't like I was forcing it I think I was forcing it at first but then it became part of my thing so like when I would hear that this is not really in four so um so I think I was interested in combining something that was very melodic with with something that was somewhat complex and yeah. that was a concern of mine for a long time and i worked hard at that i think now it's not a concern of my i don't have any preconception to it. I, I write whatever comes out but this was the, the route for me was through all this stuff so with south i think i was still in that zone of of writing melodically but also yeah. like probably trying to make it somewhat complex out beyond ideas is a classic kind of thing that i do where i i 
over it's counterpoint right i have a lot yeah, sure. of counterpoint the guitars and the you know i we overdub saxophone lines so we're playing different lines together and um you know having uh, a section that had all this counterpoint going on and i was very concerned with that i still do it if you listen to like recent like ariel two yeah, or something sure. there's yeah. a couple tunes on that record that have this counterpoint thing and over some chords and um so that's still part of it i don't i just now i don't worry about it being complex or easy or i just don't care it's just whatever comes out sometimes it'll be odd times sometimes it won't sometimes the chords will be hard sometimes whatever yeah, it is sure. um uh, the tune von joshua that is one of the few tunes i've ever written on saxophone i am mm, um, okay there's only a couple i think there's another lost tribe tune maybe mythology Mm -hmm. that i wrote on uh, which is a tune for Lush, um that i wrote on saxophone first and then wrote the chords and von joshua is one of those there's only been a couple the rest are all from the from the keyboard first or piano um and then the, another thing i do with composition is i try to always make everything melodic so i'm i try to make the chordal part melodic i try to make the bass part melodic i try to make all the interweaving so that building from the ground up everything is melodic and working together so what you have at the end of that is something that's going to be super melodic because everything yeah. is not just function it's if you if you just play a lot of my chord parts without the melodies it's still going to sound especially the yeah. top notes are going to sound like a melody same with a lot of the bass parts in that and especially in that period um so that was yeah so i think it's just always wanting to be a songwriter and then i started writing songs maybe 15 years ago actual songs that i i've now finally started to release where yeah, I, I, saw that, and yeah. Stuff. yeah and I, I saw them yeah it's amazing yeah, i think my heart has always really been there like i love all the stuff that i'm doing with you know instrumental music and all that stuff but when when i have a really good song like that's really i just i really want it if i could have one big hit tune i'd be really happy and that it's just because those are the things that mark my life even more than the instrumental stuff probably is just pop songs from a certain era and um, yeah. from different eras and uh so i kind of you know so I, anyway i do that a lot now and i and i have many songs that are going to come out soon and i'm still always writing those i'm still always Beautiful. doing all this stuff but that's part of it and i think that just comes out it's always just come out in my quote, yeah. jazz for lack of a better term i don't like terms but um in in that writing um you know the, the melody has been to be able to sing something or just remember something in that way is important to me you know i've always yeah. been attracted to that if you listen to even the greatest classical music, whatever, yeah. it's still, if it's even if it's Stravinsky or Schoenberg or whatever, it's still this melodic thing is what you're, you know, what you're, what makes a lot of that music famous. It's like it comes yeah. down to what the melody is. So sure. that's that's huge. I think that's been lost a lot in recent times, and and um, especially in pop music, but. Yeah. Uh, definitely in jazz it's like a lot of modern jazz i don't doesn't interest me at all it just seems like it's trying to be cool and not really about some emotional thing um True. and i think the me melody for me is always it's, been, it's it's easy for me to write melodies first of all but but also it's what i connect to emotionally when i'm playing in the melody to, to the computer whatever i'm writing into yeah. like i really feel that in the in a deep way you know yeah, well, when I saw that you did the, the vocal stuff, I wasn't even surprised because I remember when I babysit your cat in, and you said, like, yeah. you left me all your CD collection. I think I burned all the CDs that oh, uh, put to bring yeah. home. You know, we didn't. And I, I still remember, like you said, you know, there was like lots of George Duke, there was Stravinsky, there was that. And yeah, so, yeah. So, a lot so of Brazilian when, music. Yeah, lots yeah. Of, you know, everything. And I was like, when when the singing, and you know, you, you didn't balance, you know, the be two beautiful, I think, tracks with yeah. with vocals, which are like incredibly amazing, right? And then yeah, when, when you mean, did with you, your yeah. part, I was like, yeah, man, that's 
it's so natural that you did it actually so yeah i started singing like background things on my albums yeah. and then i sang on all those donny records i put not all of them but some of the donny records that became popular that i was producing donny mccasson records yeah. um casting for gravity and all that stuff i'm singing on all that stuff in the background and then i started to just realize you know i could just do this like sure. write lyrics to these tunes and some things and sing them you know and um so i just started doing that and so now i just do that too and um it seems very natural to me you know yeah yeah I, I just wanted to not to take more of your time Dave, but like i wanted to ask you about your ro role as a producer how do you do you see this role compared to being a composer or improviser if um, there's a distinction well I mean, I love producing, actually. That's what I was doing today when I was late to, to here was I'm producing this song by this young singer here that she's really good and she's not known, but she writes beautiful stuff. And she wrote this tune that I just love. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to produce it and get some of my favorite players on it. And um, I was just sending her the demo idea that I had anyway. I hope she, oh, hope she likes yeah. it. But, um, I, I've always wanted to be that role, like, you know, I always wanted to be, you know, Rick Rubin or something, somebody who just produced every kind of music, you know, and because I think, you know, again, I could get into a long discussion, but I talk about a lot about it when I teach, if people ask mm -hmm. about that thing, but, you know, I don't think of myself as a saxophone player or even a musician so much as like, I think at a certain point, were artists and it doesn't really matter what you play or whatever you're trying to create something that's and put something into the art world and when you start to think like that and that's kind of a maturity and a graduation mm -hmm. as you keep getting older or whatever at least for some of us i think but um the the importance of art has always been the, the biggest thing for me but just learning to be an artist and not be what everyone yeah. decides you are is a huge thing. And, um, and once you realize that you realize that it's all the same thing. So I listen to a lot of country music, for instance, I listen to a lot of everything, but I, sometimes it, someone will get in my car and I'm listening to like new country and people are like, what are you doing? Like, man, some of those tunes are unbelievable. And the lyrics are hysterical and really good or, or heart, heartfelt, and simple, but, um, really to the point of what music is sometimes and I can do get that same thing from yeah. Thomas Addis or somebody you know some or, or you know uh, you know anybody like that's that's really good at, at that um, at what they do and so but it's all the same thing I realize it's just whether it's electric or acoustic or this groove or that it's it's the art as I say to again a lot of students the art floats above us and you, you try to dip into that and grab that. It's, it's, it's something bigger than, yeah. the, our instruments are just that. They're instruments to try to define something that's bigger. Um, a lot of people would consider that religion, I'm not necessarily a religious person, but spiritual in my own way, I guess, which is yeah. basically art. Um, and, you know, trying to dip into that and bring that into whatever you do. Uh, I just started to realize that, you know, that your medium is just your medium. The other thing is a bigger thing. Uh, my wife's a painter, for instance. So we talk about this and she, she's into her thing, but she, she's doing the same thing as, as me. She's, sure. she's doing it through a paintbrush. She used to be a musician, but she, um, you know, and, and it's the same thing. So what I see in her paintings of, oh, I see this is like this song of mine or this, this movie is like, this song of mine or mm -hmm. like her pain or that dance is like this, you know, I see it as the same thing. So the, mu the music thing is that way. So as a producer, that's a good head to be in because you can get into something and see it from above in a way. I'm not thinking yeah. about it as like, oh, this is this. No, how does this, what would work best for this as just a piece of art? What would work best? What can I bring to this? Um, and you start to think that way. And so I, I think that's what I do as a producer. I've produced all my own records. Yeah. I started to produce, you know, I produced seven or eight of Donnie's records and he became 
very popular through that. Um, uh, but, you know, at one point, like the casting for Gravity thing was for, but at one point he was going to do another record. He was going to do it with the same people. And I was like, Donnie, I can't do this again. Let's let's make an electric record. And he I said, really, no. I really, oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. And I said, no, I really think we should. And I talked him into it. And I was like, let's get a bass player, a, a, a synth player and a, and a drummer and make an electric record. And he goes, OK, but I don't want synth, he said. And I was about to make a record at the time with Tim LaFave and Mark Giuliano because I, I had this, we had this trio briefly that mm. we, um, we had. So I was thinking about making a record. And I thought, you know what, I really want to be a producer. So let me give that up and put them on Donnie's record. And then we got um, Adam Benjamin because he yeah. played electric piano and, and went through effects. And Adam is great. But that's not the sound I was necessarily hearing for the record. I was hearing more of a synth thing. Um, but that record came out pretty good and Donnie was into it so by the next one he goes okay let's get a synth player we decided on Jason who we both knew yeah. and um, and then we made casting for gravity and Donnie to his credit kind of just let me do what I did so we recorded live a couple days and then I just took it home and went nuts I put you know <laughs> so many synths on it and sang and a lot of people think that's that's all Jason but it was all out oh, of wow, really? those early oh, ones. Wow. It's like me playing synths and singing and cutting things up and doing stuff. And then I ma really made it into this thing that was still, you know, uh, a raw yeah. playing album, but with this kind of pop, more pop sensibility in some yeah. way. Um, and then, you know, I mean, Maria Schneider was working with Bowie and then Maria said, to Bowie like he was looking for a band for something like jazzy or band and Maria said you should check out Donnie's band and so he heard one of my tunes on on uh, on Donnie's record it's called Brian Grand and it was mm -hmm. a tune that I talked them into doing at the end of the session nobody wanted to do it they were tired and I was like please let's do this tune we didn't really rehearse it or anything we did it and I just told Mark play as hard as you can I remember Mark's headphones at the end of the take were like sideways on his head and um, the take came out really good, and they just laughed and didn't think much of it. But, uh, you know, Donnie, I remember Donnie calling me and said, man, Bowie heard my record and heard your tune on it and freaked out. And then he came to see them at 55, and that was it, and they did Black Star. Um, you know, and I, of course, never got any credit for that that part of it. And I, you know, created that whole thing, and, and you know, it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't, you know, the role of the producer sometimes in that thing, I just... I didn't get what I should have out of that. But, um, you know, we did a couple more records after that um, that were also really good. Yeah. And um, but anyway, it, you know, I, I it was just. Production is is keeping somebody. Pushing somebody's limits in some way, but letting them feel comfortable about what they're doing, but also having an influence on the sound in some way uh, that just makes it better i mean than they would have done on their own yeah. um in this case you know donnie wouldn't even have ever probably been doing electric music um, probably yeah definitely. and but um you know so it worked but that that's really what it is and, and just understanding what this whatever project it is what it needs and that's how i looked at my projects who are, which are widely diverse and you can see that i approach yeah. them differently technically but always when you listen to it, you're going to hear a thread of like, oh, this is, you know, his work, you know, yeah. um, and having a sound, having the sound on your instrument, having the sound with your compositions, having the sound as an, a maker of art, uh, having yeah. a, a vision, that's, that's it. And that's always been a concern of mine and also something that I, I actively think about, you know, actively work on, you know, um, because if you don't, it's not just these things aren't just natural, you know, I mean, you have somewhat of a natural ability, but things are conscious Like getting back to that sure. Wayne Shorter thing, I can hear yeah. consciously, he, he had to get rid of train to become himself. There's a conscious decision in that. And, you know, so you have to always be thinking about, you know, what am I doing? Where am I in the spectrum of things? What do I, what do I want to achieve? And, and and think of what this needs, what that needs. And that's the yeah. role as a producer is the next step, the last step of, 
before uh, the, the, the final, you know, layer of of the artwork in a way, you know, um, yeah, what beautiful. it is. Yeah. So yeah. that's the way I think about it. Yeah, beautiful, man. Yeah, I mean, I, I always tell everyone of my students this example, like of of this iPod thing, <laughs> because that changed my life actually. And seeing your record collection of you yeah, know being yeah. being a jazz purist in a way, you know, like. And then I, I remember we talked about Beyonce or, or Christina Aguilera's record or Britney Spears, and mm-hmm. you know, and that's what I tell my students now. Also, you know, I listen to every mu- kind of music, whether it's Meshuga, death metal, or whatever, or electro, or yeah. You know, it's like just listen to music. It doesn't matter if yeah. it's your trash metal hat or whatever. Just you know, and right. that's that's what what just just you said. I mean, that's so important. Yeah. That's well, it's vocabulary too. I mean, even yeah. if you're not learning it literally, you're still assimilating it, as I said. Yeah. And then when you're just improvising on stage, if you're just improvising, still that stuff is there. Then you just have a wider palette. I mean, yeah. if you're limiting yourself. Sound is just sound, you know, it's just sound. We're sound makers. I always tell students, like, don't think of yourself as more. We, we just, we don't know what we're doing. We're just sound makers. That's what we do. And we're, we're just gathering sound and organizing it and putting it back out there. There are, no, there are no rules for that. There's no rule for making a sound. If, if the sound you make is, a, is, a, is effective and somebody reacts to it emotionally, or just digs it in whatever way, then you're successful. That's, I mean, you know, yeah. that's, that's what we are with sound makers. So, you know, there's, that's what I mean. You kind of have to keep looking above like what everyone says. Oh, this, this, you got to do this. You go, no, you don't. It's just sure. whatever way you find to make the sound. If you're a musician and you deal with sound to make it compelling, that's what it is. If it's compelling, it's good. If it's not, you know, Whatever, it's not, not so good. But um, so anyway, yeah, so so I just think to be exposed also to as much of what other humans have made sound wise is um is important, you know, because it gives you ideas, it it gives you an idea of where you are in that whole spectrum, yeah. and 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 doesn't limit you, you know. So, and I think sure. that again, I, that's a, an important thing to have as a producer of music um, is that sort of overview. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. yeah. Cool, man. <laughs> I, I won't yeah. take more of your time. I can listen to you like for hours. It's just like beautiful to hear you talk, but you know, yeah. to have a... I, I'm, I, I can talk. Yeah, you can talk to me more if you want or if you want to go to bed. I totally understand. But no, it's just, just, it's, I just wanted to ask you, like, well, you, you mentioned you're working on the, just the last one like on four different projects now so what what's in the can now like for you well i've i've had a lot of music that i started years ago that i just never have put out a lot of songs even the songs that i one song i put out recently called happiness mm-hmm. i wrote that song a long time ago and then i well maybe 10 years ago and then i oh. i put some some musicians on it maybe a year and a half ago and then i i sang on it just recently um and then I put it out but i have all these other songs even songs i sang like that are at least 10 years old that i keep re mixing yeah. and remastering and whatever and then adding people to and whatever that i'm gonna release so i have at least a whole album's worth of that oh. um i have this classical music that i got commissioned to write by uh, the jazz gallery in new york and we performed in, I see the, on the Pro Tools files that I started these pieces in 2009. So I'm guessing oh, wow. 2009. Yeah. And now I have one more piece to edit of the stuff that's finished um, that we recorded, you know, uh, with string orchestra, uh, piano, John Street when he was really young and really? myself. Oh, man. Oh, beautiful. There's no improvising. It's just through composed it's through composed stuff. There's no improvising. I remember when we did it oh, live man. at the at the jazz gallery, there was a conductor I had who's a strict classical conductor, and the musicians were for the most part classical people. And at one point the conductor were playing, rehearsing, and he turns around to me and he goes, This is classical music. And I was like, Well, you know, not that I love terms, but I was like, Yeah, there's there's no improvising. I was like, No, there's no improvising, it's through composed 
and they he was surprised because he they all thought they were going to get to do like a jazz record or something and it's it's really through composed some pieces are long one's like 17 minutes one's oh, like wow. 14 i have a string quartet i have some other things um that are shorter but uh I'm finishing, I'm editing the last piece of that and I'm going to mix that and then I'll put that record out. I also have a whole other, you know, collection of classical music that I wrote after that that I even like better that I've never recorded that I think that I'm going to have recorded here probably in the next year or so. And then I have, um, I'm always working on like the aerial kind of records, mm -hmm. Aerial 1, Aerial 2. Mm -hmm. I'm always working on that stuff. Um, and I have, music with Lewis and Lewis Cole and Genevieve Artadi, mm -hmm. which is with Noah. I've you know, been friends with them for 10, 11, 12 years. Stuff we did years ago that um, I just may release my tunes from, which are like an EP. Oh, um, I just got an earthquake, earthquake notification, life in California. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, I'm trying to think what else. Uh, I have the acoustic record of, of compositions I did a couple years ago with these young people that are kind of long through composed things but a lot of improvising with Luca oh, Mendoza, Vince Mendoza's son, um, two bass players, um, Logan Kane and Ethan Moffat, and uh, another piano player, Paul Cornish, who also plays on the track, and the great young drummer who's in the Hancock Institute, Benjamin Ring, um, all great musicians from out here. And it's really good. And when I moved out here, I realized, wow, I have these young guys that are down to rehearse. I can write harder music than I could in, in New York. Mm. Um, they're really quick. They're like Dan and, and Jacob or Craig and yeah, all these guys, yeah. Matter, uh, and the Ivan and Thomas, really quick and really good. And so we, we learned all this really hard music and played it around a lot and then recorded it. So it's really cool. Justin Brown plays with me a lot out here. He's played a lot of that music. Oh, really? wow. um, so, you know, um, that's going to come out. Um, yeah. And then just in my head, I always have like other stuff that oh I want to do this and that so it's always happening but those are the those are the next things there's also a record that I did with Antonio Sanchez Ben Monder and Matt Brewer it's a double album that went to Cam Jazz in Italy and they've never released it and it was done like three four years ago and it's a really good record double like album. your your compositions I mean all of ours and some improvising I really? have a little oh, bit man. more compositions on it but yeah oh, wow. but Damn. but um it was a thing I put together to do at New Blue, and, and, Ant yeah. and Antonio really loved it. He was like, Let, let's do it as a record. I was like, cool. He got Cam Jazz involved. We did it. Then they just never released it. I don't oh, man. have no idea why. We did the cover and everything, and then it's not released. Anyway, that's out, out there, and it's a really good record. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of stuff. A lot, a lot yeah. more stuff. Beautiful, man. I mean, Super. Yeah. Looking forward. Yeah. Yeah. So, cool. Man. cool. Right, Dave. Oh, well, mine says low battery, so maybe this oh, is... Oh, yeah, yeah, it's okay. Yeah, that's a sign yeah. that we've finished. <laughs> but yeah, 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 thanks for sharing all this stuff, and nice to see you after a long time, so... Yeah, but, thanks uh, for asking yeah. me. I'm glad that we could finally do it, and um, yeah, I, hopefully I'll see you soon. Yeah, man. Dr. Jazz.